Welcome to part two of our cranial nerve examination. My name is Dr. Mayam. If you have not watched part one, please make sure to watch that before you watch this video. In this video, we're going to start with cranial nerve seven or the facial nerve. So cranial nerve seven is both sensory and motor. It supplies motor innervation to the muscles of facial expression as well as the stapedius muscle which is involved in sound regulation. The sensory component supplies the taste parts to the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. Don't confuse that with sensation because the sensation to the anterior two-thirds of the tongue is supplied by the lingual nerve which comes from D3 which is the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve which is cranial nerve 5. So to test for the facial nerve, we start with the sensory and we ask the patient to tell us if they've noticed any changes in their taste. After the sensory part, then we test for the motor part. And for the motor part, we start with testing for the stapedius muscle. Because the stapedius muscle is involved in the regulation of sound, if the cranial nerve 7 is affected, there will be hyperacusis. So sounds will be noticeably louder to the patient. So to do that, we stand behind the patient and we ask, Sir, can you hear this? Does it sound the same on both sides? The last part in testing for the facial nerve involves testing for the muscles of facial expression. To do that, we need to inspect the patient first before we pluck it. To inspect the face of the patient, we ask the patient to relax and look forward. So we inspect the patient's forehead for any presence or absence of wrinkling, then the nasolabial fold, and then the corners of the mouth to see if there's any drooping. After that, we ask the patient to do certain maneuvers. So sir, can you please look up and then don't let me push it down. Thank you. Can you please close your eyes? Don't let me open it. Thank you. Can you please pop your cheeks? Don't let me pop it. Thank you. Can you please press your lips? And can you do this? <laughs> okay, thank you. That concludes examination of the facial nerve. But before we move on, you need to know the difference between an upper motor neural lesion of the facial nerve and a lower motor lesion of the facial nerve. An upper motor neural lesion of the facial nerve usually spares the eyes. So we say upper spares upper. So that means in an upper motor neuron of the facial nerve, the mouth, the mouth may be drooping a bit. The patient might have weak pressing and puffing, but there will be retained eye closure. That means the patients can close their eyes with power. because This is because there's dual innervation to both sides. However, in a lower motor neural lesion, the entire side of the face will be affected, including the eyes. One example of a cause of an upper motor neuron lesion of the facial nerve is stroke, while an example of a lower motor neuron lesion of the facial nerve is Bell's palsy. So the next examination is the vestibular cochlear nerve or cranial nerve 8. This is purely sensory, but it has two components. The vestibular component, which is responsible for balance, and the cochlear component, which is responsible for hearing. So we're first going to start with the vestibular part. For this, we need to ask the patient to stand up put their feet together, close their eyes, and march in one place. If abnormal, the patient will turn towards the side of the lesion. That concludes the vestibular part. Now for the cochlear part, we test it in two parts. First of all, we whisper to the patient, and then we perform two tests. We'll start with the whispers. So for the whisper test, we occlude the air from the other side by closing the travis, and then we maintain some distance between us and the patient, and we whisper something and ask them to repeat it. We do the same on the other side. While applying travel pressure, we whisper. 99. For the next part of the exam, we're going to use our 512 tuning form to test for the Rene and Weber test. So the Rene and Weber test need to be done together and interpreted in the context of each other. You can't do one alone and expect to get enough information to interpret. Definitely if a patient has abnormal hearing or normal hearing. We're starting with the Rene test. So the way to do the Rene test is you explain to the patient, Sir, I'm going to make this vibrate as a vibrate is going to make a sound. I'm going to place it behind your ear. If you can hear it, please tell me. And when it stops, I want you to tell me as well. Okay? So we make it vibrate and we place it on the mastoid process of the patient's ipsilateral ear. Can you hear it, sir? Tell me when it stops. Stop. Can you still hear it? Yes. So, after we place it on the mastoid process, we ask the patient if they can hear. If they can hear it, we wait for it to stop. If they stop hearing it, we move the still vibrating tuning fork close to the ear, 
and ask the patient if they can hear it. Normal is that the patient should still be able to hear it because air conduction should be more than bone conduction. Next, we do the Weber test. To perform the Weber test, we make the tuning fork vibrate and we place it on the forehead of the patient. Sir, can you hear it? Yes. Is it the same in both ears or one ear is louder? The same in both ears. Thank you. So if the patient's air conduction is more than bone conduction with the Rene test, and in the Weber test, the patient hears it equally in both ears, we can say that the patient has normal hearing. To know what an abnormal test is like, we're going to have a separate video for that, so make sure to watch that video. We're going to move on for the purpose of time with the next cranial nerve in this video. So the next cranial nerves to test for are cranial nerves 9 and 10, which are respectively glossopharyngeal and vagus. They are tested together because they have similar functions. They are both sensory and motor. The glossopharyngeal nerve supplies both sensation and taste to the posterior one third of the tongue and it supplies motor innervation to the gag reflex. The vagus nerve gives parasympathetic innervation to most of the body as well as sensory innervation to the throat and it gives the motor sensation as well to the gag reflex, just like the glossopharyngeal nerve. So to test them together, all we have to do is ask the patient to open their mouth and say, ah. So can you please open your mouth and say ah? Ah. So when they open the mouth and they say ah, we look at the uvula. Is it deviated to one particular side? In the case of a uvula deviation, you need to know that it deviates towards the normal side. This is because this is the uvula, right? And they're pulling on each other. That's their normal action. So because they're equally active on both sides, that means both nerves are equally active on both sides in a normal situation, their oppo the opposing forces will be balanced out. So if this side is weak, for example, then this muscle will overpower this and the uvula will be pulled towards the normal side. So that's seen in an abnormal situation. The next step is to give something to the patient, a liquid, and ask them to swallow. Sir, can you please swallow? Thank you. And lastly, we assess for the gag reflex, which we don't usually do. The next nerve is cranial nerve 11, which is the accessory nerve. So the accessory nerve is purely motor, and it gives motor innervation to the sternocleidomastoid muscle and the trapezius muscle. So how we test for that is we test the power of those muscles against resistance. So to test for the sternocleidomastoid of the left side, we ask the patient to look to the right, because that's the action of the left sternocleidomastoid muscle. It pushes the patient's face to the other side. So sir, can you please look to the right, and don't let me push your face back. Thank you. Can you now please look to the left? And this, this time we're testing for the right sternocleidomastoid. Please don't let me push it. Thank you. You can look straight. Can you please raise your shoulders and don't let me push it down? This test is to test for the power of the trapezius muscle. Thank you. The last cranial nerve that we test for is the hypoglossal nerve, which is cranial nerve 12. The cranial nerve 12, or the hypoglossal nerve, is purely motor in function, supplying the muscles of the tongue. So how we test for the hypoglossal nerve is we ask the patient to start, can you please open your mouth? and bring out your tongue. So we observe the tongue for any wasting and for circulations. Then we ask the patient, sir, can you please do this? To point their tongue inside the cheek and we try to resist. Don't let me push it. Can you please do on the other side? Thank you. So when the patient brings out their tongue, we also need to check for deviation. So in this case, it's the opposite of the uvula. The tongue is deviated towards the weaker side. Why? Because unlike the uvula, they were pulling on each other, the tongue muscles are actually pushing against each other, which was the opposite motion that the uvula was doing. So the tongue muscles are pushing against each other. You can imagine that if one side is weak, like the left, the right muscles will overpower the left muscles and they will push the tongue towards that side. So that's why in a hypoglossal nerve injury, the tongue will be deviated towards the abnormal side. This brings us to the end of our video. If you liked anything I had to say or learned anything, please drop a like. If you have any questions, leave it in the comment section below. Most importantly, don't forget to subscribe. Thank you for watching and as always, I'll see you next time.